we're, we're not in a position where we're willing to get back to the negotiating table with Iran just based on the fact that they've elected a new president. They're still supporting terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. They're still supporting the Houthis as the Houthis attack ships in the Red Sea. Uh, they're still attacking shipping uh, as well. And they're still supplying drones and drone technology and drone expertise to the Russians so that the Russians can continue to kill innocent Ukrainians like they did over the weekend. So, no, no. This guy seems a bit more moderate. Do you see any opening? We'll, look, we'll, we'll see what this guy wants to get done, but we are not expecting any changes in Iranian behavior. Well, James Dorsey is an adjunct senior fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies and joins us now live from Singapore. Well, James, we, we heard it very clearly there from the White House spokesman John Kirby. There's very little chance of any new dialogue between the United States and Iran. So how exactly is Mr. Pazeshkian going to achieve any of those pre-election promises? Well, I think that uh, Masoud Pazeshkian has two problems. One is domestic. When it comes to certainly to foreign policy, uh, the president is the executioner of that policy. He's not the one that decides that policy. He does have an input into it, but ultimately it's the Iranian National Security Council and more importantly, the supreme leader. The second issue is that uh, even if there were a more positive attitude from the United States, the uh, the United States is going to do nothing prior to the November election. And we will have to see what the outcome uh, of that election is. Obviously, the response to Iran may be different under a second term Biden administration than under a second term Trump administration. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that both sides, Iranians and Americans, feel burnt by the past experience in trying to come to some understanding. Obviously, the Iranians feel burnt by the fact that uh, then President Trump walked away from an agreement that his predecessor had made. And the Americans feel that uh, the Iranians are not living up to their past promises. Uh, and so that's, uh, and then there are all the other issues which your correspondent mentioned. Pazeshkian mm. um, is not going to fundamentally alter Iranian policy. No, so, no and, and, and it's fair to say that the people of Iran have heard all this before from previous progressive or, or reformist candidates who have taken the presidency. Um, do you think that explains the, the apathy when it came to voter turnout in the recent election? I, I think one's got to look at the, uh, the turnout somewhat layered. In other words, turnout because of lack of faith in the in the political process and in the uh, the willingness of the regime to uh, to change things has led to increasingly lower turnouts. On the other hand, you, one could argue that uh, the Pazeshkian uh, success in the last round of elections in Iran uh, is a message of change, not only in terms of those who voted for him, but also in terms of those who didn't vote for him. In a sense, they voted with their feet for change. With other words, a significant majority of Iranians wants to see change. And I think that's the message uh, of this election, whether or not they believe Pazeshkian can develop, can, can, can produce it. Um, having said that, I think Iranians also realize that there are limitations to what Pazeshkian can achieve. Mm. And just how, uh, what his margins are remains to be seen. Yeah, one hopes he's a skillful diplomat because he's going to need all of that for the tightrope act. Uh, we thank you very much indeed for your analysis, James. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.